Hi, everyone. It is about noon on a Sunday, and you're here. <laughs> you just love funding and open source. Uh, some of you have seen this talk before. It's basically the same, so I encourage you to uh, also scroll through your phone and reflect on your life. Um, thank you so much for coming out uh, on this honestly sweltering day to talk about the state of open source software funding. Um, I'm Kara. I live here locally in Portland. So if you live locally, let's say I sometime. Um, I work at GitHub uh, and I work directly with uh, free uh, open source software maintainers, helping advocate for them internally at the company, helping advocate for them in the industry and stuff like that. Um, and it means that I get to hear about and talk about funding a lot in the context of how those people are putting food on the table and projects in the world. Um, last year, I thought about this a lot as I was running the inaugural cohort of the GitHub Accelerator, and I also do a maintainer community and stuff like that. So if you're interested in any of that and hearing more, let me know. But that's not what we're here for right now. Um, I'm going to talk about... Excuse me, that's so rude. Making sound on my phone. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to talk um, a little bit about all of these things, but uh, I want to be extremely clear. We're only talking about cash today, like just money. The majority of things that open source software and free software projects need are not money. In fact, plenty of projects might even say money is not the answer necessarily, but I don't have that much time, so we can really only talk about one thing. So we're going to talk about just cash, uh, and please forgive me for this. There's a lot of monetary value in open source, and there's been some great reports that have come out since um, this deck was built in January for FOSDEM. Um, but the one that I've got in here is from the European Commission study on the impact of open source on the European economy. They say companies in the EU invested around 1 billion euros in open source software in 2018, which brought a positive impact on the European economy of 65 to 95 billion. We predict that an increase of 10% in contributions to open source software code would annually generate an additional 0.4 to 0.6% GDP. Uh, do we care about this? No, we're at Fosse. <laughs> we're not here to make people money, but there is money. <laughs> There's money in the ecosystem. It's happening. Uh, it should be there. So let's talk about where it does and doesn't exist. Um, this is my kind of crude chart. Uh, for how money flows through the open source software ecosystem, and we'll go through it bit by bit. So why do we care about funding open source software maintenance? Um, this is maybe a little redundant for, again, folks who chose to show up to Fosse, but um, we do know that 90% of companies minimum use open source. I think the ones who say they don't are lying. Um, we know that FOSS constitutes 70 to 90% of any given piece of modern software solutions. So our proprietary software, et cetera, et cetera, is mostly built up of open source. Um, we know that 89% of code bases containing open source more than four years out of date, which I don't love as much. The good, the good feeling is going down. Um, and 84% of code bases contained at least one known open source vulnerability. Um, there's a lot of reasons to care about software maintenance, um, and we could list all of them, but we'll do this easy one at least to know why a lot of folks are kind of sweating a bit. Um, what do we know about open source uh, software maintainers and money? So the majority of what we have on this right now is from Tidelift's survey. This is from their 2023 um, open source maintainer survey. So we know that 60% of maintainers are unpaid hobbyists. Um, and, and of those, we've got 14% are like, I don't want to get paid. Please leave me alone. Please don't ruin this for me. <laughs> don't ruin the thing I love to do. So obviously not everyone wants to be paid, but 60% are unpaid. And of those 77% would prefer to be paid, which is fair. Um, we also know that 44% of maintainers are solo maintainers. So if they win the lottery and they move to a remote island, good for them. I'm so happy the project doesn't have someone to step in. Um, we know the classic Nebraska problem here, right? We know that 58% of maintainers have at least considered quitting a project, which haven't we all, but 22% have actually gotten to that point and been like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like you shouldn't 
make a piece of software and then be like, I'm tied to this forever. Like I'm, I'm shackled to this and I live in eternal servitude to it. Like you should be able to step away. You should be able to have a way to close it down or hand it off or something like that. But the way that it's currently structured, we have a lot of people with nothing to do with their project when they're burnt out and no funds to continue running it. Um, we do know on the solution front that 56% earning, said earning more money for maintenance work would actually keep them from quitting. So there we go. There's, let's, let's, let's go find that money. So first let's talk about funding platforms that money runs through. And I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly again so there's a lot of, I can't touch on, but funding platforms basically just enable payments to FOSS projects and maintainers. Um, so here we see from whether it's the individual or a company through to the funding platform to the project or the maintainer. Um, funding platforms, there's a lot of them, they have specialties. Um, some are all purpose. We've got dependency funding, which thanks.dev and StackAid do a lot of. We've got Kickstarter's one-time crowdfunding model that really picked up. We've got ongoing crowdfunding, which Patreon's especially good at. We've got tipping platforms like Buy Me a Coffee, recurring income like LibrePay, direct tips people just send through PayPal or Venmo. Um, I'm going to only talk about two funding platforms, and it's because it's ones that I have more data for, um, and also because they cover a bunch of these different aspects of platforms. Um, but this is not me saying that I actually prefer one platform or another. I think these all p play important parts in the ecosystem. Um, and I also will not touch on, there's a lot of other funding models. There's subscription models like Tidelift. There's service marketplaces like Open Teams. There's quadratic funding, which is a whole other uh pony show so we'll skip all that too <laughs> so um so i can't talk about github sponsors because i work at github um and so i do know that since 2019 40 million dollars came through github sponsors directly to maintainers of projects um this looks like a mistake but it's actually not i thought it was a mistake when i did the math open collective also it's been 40 million dollars through since 2019 <laughs> so that's good right that gives us a, a solid baseline um, and so, uh, open source collective, because they actually make their numbers open, which I love, um, and most platforms unfortunately do not, um, they can say that 10 million came through the platform in 2023. So that gives us a little bit of, of scope for that. Um, funding platforms are really important here because they lower that barrier for sponsorship and they make it easier for people to give these projects money. Um, and specifically they make it easier for FOSS contributor funds. So, uh, a FOSS contributor fund is, um, this is from Indeed's uh, framework for it, a framework for selecting open source projects that a company supports financially. This initiative is designed to encourage open source participation and help companies take an active role in sustaining the projects they depend on. Now, what's really important about a FOSS fund, which at this point colloquially is just any like company funding open source project that has something practical to it, um, is, here we go, you can see the company going through a funding platform to a project maintainer, um, is in 2019, Dwayne O'Brien, who is in the room uh, over at Indeed, started this model of a, yeah, of a FOSS fund, right? And this really, this took off. A lot of companies that weren't ready to make a statement on if they were funding FOSS in any way or how they were funding came out and modeled, like modeling on what Dwayne and the team at Indeed did said, we are going to commit a certain amount of money and we're going to do it publicly. Um, and you can see this impact. There's a lot of other companies as well that took the model, but here's just a few. You can see this impact in large companies coming out and being explicit about that. Um, I think what's really important here too is like on GitHub sponsors, we saw the average value of an organization giving a sponsorship versus individuals 15x. So the impact there is, is huge. Um, so back in the napkin math, um, I think in 2023, about $12 million passed through FOSS funds, um, which is incredible insofar as this was not happening to the same degree before 2019. Like this is fantastic growth. But at the same time, it's also a very sad number <laughs> because it's only $12 million and we know the value of all these companies that we're looking at. This can't sustain an ecosystem. This can't, this can't do it. And when I saw that this was the publicly committed funding that companies were talking about, I think my heart sank as much as I was excited for everyone who fought for this money to happen, to happen. Because we'd be in big trouble without it. <laughs> so here's a couple patterns, I think, around FOSS contributor funds. 
Um, I think that FOSS funds are substantially benefiting maintainers, but it's not a sustainable single model for the ecosystem. So we need more than FOSS funds. Um, they're good, but we can't say this is our one model and we're going to fall back on that. So um, part of that is that they're, for the most part, I don't think contributing to stable or predictable funding because companies will often internally vote on what projects they're going to support, which is really healthy for getting employees engaged in open source. It's awesome. And that's, that's crucial, but that's not a sustainable funding model. That's a different kind of a thing um, because projects don't know if they're going to get the money. Um, and they don't know if they'll get it again. I think this also shows that expecting companies to fund open source for the positive press is a failed path. People say, well, make the companies feel like they're getting a lot of attention for doing it and they'll do it. Well, some companies did get attention for it. They did do it. It was great. It had an impact, but it's not a big enough impact to sustain an ecosystem. And I think what really proves this is that a lot of companies that have done FOSS funds that I found did not want to talk about it publicly because they were contributing numbers that, while internally people fought really hard for, didn't look impressive from the outside when you look at the you know, market cap of, a, of the value of a corporation. And so it wasn't impressive enough to toot the horn. It was more that passionate people were fighting for it. I don't think positive press is going to be the answer, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> I mean, similarly, I also don't think negative press will do it, but that's a whole other thing. Um, I think FOSS funds are particularly vulnerable to macroeconomic conditions. We saw this in 2023. It was a very, very serious drop, and we are still in it. It has not fully bounced back in any way um, and is impacting projects a lot. And 2023 taught us that, you know, those that had been saying corporate funding was fickle were, were spot on um, and that it can disappear in, in a heartbeat. And I think that's really important, too, because how do we look at models that don't rely on a specific VP still being there. <laughs> you know, like that's not a model. Um, FOSS funds are also not a focus for most OSPOs that I've talked to. Um, most open source program offices have a limited budget. They're doing killer stuff with it. It's awesome. But they often focus that budget on getting employees engaged in open source and having the in internally folks at the company understand open source and contribute back. Um, they don't often have a ton of extra budget to contribute to a FOSS fund model. Some do, but but most actually don't. Um, so while OSPOs are still an underfunded um, team within companies, I think that's a barrier for this model. Um, there's also two strategies for distribution of money. I think long, large sums to like a couple of projects at a time or spreading like peanut buttering over and being like we hit 99% of our dependencies. There is an agreement on if there's a perfect model here. Some companies do both, some do one, some do the other. Um, I think it's really actually cool and interesting that like there's no consensus because they both have great ups and downs and I think they're both good in different ways. Um, and I think the last thing here for a pattern is just that companies sharing their funding structures has paid off. Like indeed sharing what they did had a big impact and other companies after them that came out and said we're doing this have had a big impact and continuing to get companies to share that information will continue to have impact. You got this whole slide because we had the time for the longer talk version. So um, strengthening the FOSS fund model. I think we need more data. So we need to improve data for identifying companies' dependencies at the deepest level. Obviously, there's a bunch of different tools working on this. Um, but distributing funding without relying on project charisma is really essential here. Um, from this study in 2021, um, you can see the factor that most affects sponsorship is the developer's social status in the community. It's true. It's not a great <laughs> thing. So like, how do we have d data so we make sure we're looking at what dependencies are instead of what projects are the most charismatic? Um, also, the data on the benefits that funders receive from sponsoring projects, um, being able to prove to companies that they are getting a benefit and that projects are actually improving in a lot of ways that isn't entirely proven. There's some more data that's come out this year, but like at what point does funding a project actually help it and at what point does it potentially hurt it? We don't have answers to a lot of that. Um, awareness, more companies, as we said, committing publicly, and then lower administrative cost of bulk funding. It's a lot of work for companies to go through and individually sponsor projects. It's why um, like tools like Sponsors, Open Collective, stuff like that is popular, like thanks.dev for being able to do a bunch at once. But it's still a much higher burden than, as we'll talk later, the foundation model for a company to give to. 
let's talk about individuals. You. Let's talk about you or me giving money directly to FOSS projects and maintainers. Um, so here we've got individual to funding platform or just straight cash. Not I've never seen someone hand someone cash at a software conference, but, you know, Venmo. <laughs> Um, maybe we should start that. Oh, you maintain that project? And you just like pull a 20. <laughs> um, <laughs> Scott and Bleak. Uh, so so <laughs> we, we know that in 2022, 60% of GitHub sponsors funding came from individuals. Now, first of all, that's awesome in terms of like nice work. Like, damn, you're doing it. Like you're doing the work. You should feel good. On the flip side, Oh no. <laughs> like we I don't think I don't think us paying out of our pockets can maintain the ecosystem either. Even less so. I think I think we're going to need some some uh some money from other sources. So across funding platforms, individuals are significantly outperforming company funds. Um across this is on funding platforms. This does not include um again like large uh, foundation uh money and stuff like that. But if you just look at the the funding platforms that money goes through. Um ongoing sponsorships but individuals have prov proven to be more resilient to economic downturns. So when I looked at the data for 2023 across different platforms and the corporate money went bleep, uh, individuals kept on going. Like your eggs were twice as expensive, but you kept funding the projects you cared about. Uh, so again, nice work, people. But um, I, I was very impressed. But it's uh, we need to find a model that has that same resiliency <laughs> uh, while our eggs are twice as expensive. So let's see, where's the money? Where's the money going? Um, let's talk about joining or starting a foundation, which is really one of the more common methods of funding open source projects. And obviously we are here thanks to the Software Freedom Conservancy, which does support uh, FOSS projects, which is awesome. So um, here we've got, yeah, so the company's still in this model, right? We've got the company via membership and donation, giving to a software foundation, giving to project or maintainers. Um, there's some individual, I don't have a line there for the individual as well. But the, the bulk of the money goes through there. And then we should probably have some grant money coming down to the Software Foundation as well. Um, we also have here, as you can see, we'll talk about that, the company employment line going through to, to projects, which I will count in part as part of the foundation model. So in 2022, uh, the new numbers are out, but I haven't done the math. Uh, in 2022, uh, $304 million dollars across the top 32 software foundations, excluding Wikimedia. Um, and this is the like Kara math, but, um, but it's real math. So <laughs> uh, that's a lot more money. It's a lot less money than I thought it would be, though. I, I w at the end, if that's cool, yeah. Um, so um, in 2022, 177 million of that goes through the Linux Foundation. Um, and 127 million goes through everything else. So you can also see here, when you look at the models of how a foundation supports its project, I think it's really important to look at the Linux Foundation model specifically because we know that that's where um, the bulk of the funding is going through um, to those projects. So how foundations support project depends by foundation, it depends by project. Um, I will not speak for the SF. FC here, but in general, you get legal financial services, project governance help, hosting services, marketing and advocacy, security audits often, help traveling to events and meetings, um, like IP copyright help, stuff like that. Um, foundations do a lot of work helping projects exist and continue. Um, foundations paying money for project maintenance in terms of paying project maintainers directly to upkeep the project is actually very rare. That is an unusual part. Um, some It happens with some foundations and some projects, but on the whole, it's very rare. So who's the professional maintainer? We saw at the Tidelift sur survey at the beginning that like 13% of folks were like, I'm a professional maintainer. What is that? So LF Research 2023, among critical open source projects, the majority of maintainers and core contributors enjoy full-time employment. They are full-time employed maintaining their projects. Um, this is where basically the, the model that we have functioned for the ecosystem is that um, foundations advocate for companies to hire people to maintain projects. Um, the foundation takes care of the project and the company takes care of paying the people to work on it. Um, I know 
people in this room are aware of it because many of you are part of that model. But actually, a lot of folks are not aware that this is how the ecosystem kind of functions here, which has been surprising. So for foundation patterns, um, again, most software foundations do not directly pay for project maintenance. Um, being a professional maintainer that's employed or contracted by a foundation versus a corporation is actually very rare. Um, this means that there's a lot of vulnerability to maintainers to get moved around a company and stuff like that. Um, I know we talk a lot about corporate interests and that's a big concern, but I think as well, just like the shifting tides within a company can uh, move someone from a project. Um, it's, it doesn't have that, again, it doesn't have that stability. It has that fickle quality to it. Um, foundations do focus on removing the overhead of operating a project, which is great. So if we ask maintainers to wear a dozen hats and a foundation can take 10 of those hats, like awesome, that makes it possible. So I think that's really good and crucial. Um, foundations have to have a very tight loop with companies uh, who rely on their projects because maintainers getting paid depends on it. And I think this is where, I mean, you see all the money going through, you know, to, to the LF and stuff like that is uh, foundations have to have these super tight company loops and they have figured out how to make donating to open source easy for companies. It's very hard for a company to say, how are we gonna support all our dependencies? How do we get all these people money? What benefits do we get for each of it? I don't have time to manage this. It's easy to write a check to a foundation and say, I have a, I have a silver seat on the board or nothing, or my name is on the website and this is exactly what we get and we support this roster of projects. Um, and that is something that a company accounting budgets do understand a lot clearer. So foundations have kind of cracked the code, I think, on that. Um, and well, I'll, uh, I think what's real, I don't have a slide on this here, but I, I'm really interested. Philly Valsorda has been doing interesting work with how do you build basically a, a version of the foundation model that's like, how do you get a group of professional maintainers maintaining a set of projects that it's easy for a company to pay? Um, so his work on doing that in the Go ec ecosystem, I think, is really promising. Philippe uh, Valsorda, I've got it on a slide at the end. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about grants. One-time funding agreement based on a proposal to do a specific piece of work, usually via governmental agency or philanthropy. So here we can see the money going from a philanthropic org, which is like there's a really rich person, and then they're like, I'll give some money to something, and they go there, or the government, which takes a bunch of money from us and companies, um, and that going through via grants. So my favorite uh, is the Sovereign Tech Fund. Um, for those that are not familiar with STF, it's an initiative of the German government. It's sick. Um, they've identified <laughs> 195 critical technologies. They've supported 40 of them since October 2022, over 15 million euros invested in their first year of their program, and they've done really great report outs on it. It's a wonderful example of a government saying we are going to invest in software that we depend on, and the STF funds um, maintainers and projects all over the world, not just not just German maintainers, not just German projects. I think what sets the SDF aside with this is the focus on maintenance funding. So funding the stuff that's like like the dull, boring, like let's keep the project going work instead of the like exciting, like let's build something new. Um, and this is a model I would love to see more of. Um, the Open Technology Fund um, just did their first um, FOSS maintenance fund along the same model, and that's in the States. So it's like half government funding, half corporate funding kind of coming together. So I think the OTF is a really interesting example of that too. Um, grant funding patterns. When I, <laughs> when, I talk, when I talk to people about grants, it's like most of us, I'd be like, I don't know what's a grant. And then if it was the scientific or academic space, people are like, grants that's like my that's my lunch like i do grants every day so there's <laughs> there's very little i think awareness of grants outside of academic and scientific space um although i know organizations like the stf are, are really familiar with it um but uh let's see so for scientific software funding agencies like the nsf and nasa they're looking to advance software with an academic or research relationship so you get that coming through but they want fresh advancements they want new tools so it's not usually maintenance focused Similarly, philanthropy is more slow in CZI. They also prefer to fund new things. There's a limited pool for open source and you get kind of all the people keep saying, it's just me and all my friends trying to access the same small pool of money. <laughs> but all your friends are cool. You should all get money. Um, here you see the European Commission for uh, Development of a Funding Mechanism for Sustaining Open Source Software 2022. There is a clear need for a European funding mechanism to help sustain critical open source software communities. So I am, I am hopeful. Um, I think there is movement on this in, 
in uh, at least the, the EU and in some in the US. Uh, venture funding. So um, venture funding is where someone gives you a bunch of money and then they own you. Um, and then you figure that out from there, I guess. Um, so <laughs> venture fund uh, via investment to often a related business built around a project. Um, I don't know a ton about this, but I'd be remiss not to include it. Uh, so investment in open core businesses is increasing. Um, so you can see uh, OSS Capital's cost VC funding report, August 2022. The cost category has grown dramatically over the last decade from 10 billion to 500 billion today. Even so, we are still in the early stages of cost, which we believe will grow into $3 trillion category by 2023, 2030. So, I mean, the vultures are circling, but we know that. Um, so f I think f founders need to work with VCs who really understand the peculiarities and the strengths of open source. And this is where people get in trouble as they end up being offered big chunks of money by people who do not actually understand open source uh, and then have expectations that have no relationship to what the project should or could be doing. Um, and so in order to have healthy relationships between an influx of capital and potential open core businesses. Um, we need to have those open conversations about what that looks like, what a good funder is in that category. Um, and I think there's a lot more that needs to happen there. Um, we need materials to help maintainers determine what kind of funding is actually a good match for them. Like where are the resources on that? How do we help people who are, you know, whoops, I was developing something in the open source AI space and now everyone wants to give me a ton of money and I don't know what's happening. You know, how do we, how do we help people navigate that? Um, so I thought about this a lot last year, GitHub Accelerator, we took 20 open source projects, we gave them 20K funding per project, 10 week program. It's the funding was just, we gave you money. We didn't take ownership. They weren't businesses for the most part. Like we were just like, here's some money. Let's see if we can help you figure out a sustainable business model. And this was intentionally experimental because I don't know the answer. If someone here knows the answer, please give a talk on it. But like, I, there's not one model, right? There's a big diversity of models and like, how do we help people find the right thing? So this was kind of our experimental look at that. Um, we did find there was in fact no one, one size fits all approach to open source software funding. Um, we did see a big need for more education um, and I think we need more accelerators like this that do not require projects to be startups that so will take projects that are long running, that are old, that are like, we're, we're never going to be commercial. We're true FOSS. Like, how do you help those folks navigate the space without expecting them to, I don't know, make your pal money down the line? Um, so the big barriers that yeah, independent FOSS maintainers face that we, that really, I think came out, this is my list coming out of GitHub Accelerator. And uh, you'll all be very familiar with this, but um, understanding of build business models. Um, so information on the pros and cons of different funding paths is pretty limited and it's hard for a lot of folks to navigate. I think there's a lot of like knowledge that we know and folks in the room know and we all talk about, but how is that actually recorded and how do people access that? Maintainer care, many projects are solo maintained and there's really limited resources for how maintainers can help take care of themselves. Um, Community perception, there's an expectation that maintainers work on their projects full time, but then also shaming maintainers for needing money. And it's just like very complicated. You, you talk to people who are like, so I'm not supposed to make money, but I'm supposed to do this all the time and everyone's mad at me no matter what I do. That's not really fun or cool. You know, a, a legitimate barrier. Legal guidance um, that actually understands the intricacies of open source. This is something that foundations, you know, definitely really help with. Sustainability mentorship. Um, so uh, there's a lack, I think, of mentorship between maintainers who have taken funding paths with their projects. Um, projects across ecosystems don't talk to each other as often as I think would be healthy. And how do we set up mentorship between projects that have been like, please don't make the mistake I made or like, absolutely, this worked for me. Um, how do we talk publicly about what funding has and hasn't worked for a project? Measuring impact, um, I think maintainers need better ways to measure the impact of their software and define what companies are using it um, and who to reach out to. There's a lot of complications with this. Obviously, we don't want tracking. How do we communicate? There's a lot of questions around this that I think are kind of unaddressed. Um, and then fiscal management, accounting, uh, requiring industry-specific expertise and advice. Uh, a lot of projects will say, oh, no, someone gave me money and I don't even know how to spend it. I don't legally know how to spend it, let alone what to do with it. <laughs> and how do we get people this specific advice as well? Um, 
so I'll, I'll end with like a fun little experiment in funding that I like. Um, this is Simon Wilson of Dataset um, and also of the top of Hacker News every week. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Who uh, Who is in Accelerator. And one of the things that he was trying to pitch on was um, paying maintainers to speak to your team. So how do you take underutilized company training and consulting budgets? Because there's always money for training and consulting somehow. There's not money for other things. Um, and use that for a time box consultation with an open source maintainer for a project that the company depends on. The internal team gets to speak to the expert. Um, it supports the project. It's not an ongoing thing where the maintainer has to keep giving support over time and it like runs their time into the ground um, and it taps into a budget that's underutilized. So I'm really interested as well in smaller experiments like this that are like, how do we find where money is and then move it move it around a little better because I don't know that our system's really fully functioning. And then here you can see also Filippo Valsorda's experiment with retainer agreements for full-time maintainers and extra advice tiers I think is is really divine. I love that. Um, so putting it all together, I don't know, man. We talked some about how money moves through the ecosystem. Um, I look forward to people making an even better and more accurate version of this, right? This is a first pass. I've given this talk. Um, I gave it at FOSDEM this year and then stayed it open in the UK and then up in Seattle at Open Source Software Summit. And then this is the last time I'm giving it. And this is it. Uh, I'm so, so pleased that you came to listen to it. But what I really look forward to is kind of what comes next. Um, I don't have the answers, but I think it starts with us at least saying what's the state of how money is moving right now before we try to figure out how we want it to move and where we can leverage it from. Um, missions and what's next. So if you want something to do, uh, we need more data. <laughs> can your org do like a survey? Can you release trends that you see on your internal data? Um, how do we pry some of that out? We need more companies obviously publicly committing to funding. Um, if you look at FOSS funders, um, again, like Dwayne's work with FOSS funders and stuff like that, fantastic. Can you join that? Can your company be public about it? It makes a difference. Maintainers need more resources and mentorship. Can you help a project with that? Um, how do we do it? We can advocate for government funding. Um, and then 2023 was a reminder that corporate budgets and priorities are fickle and any funding plan needs to take this into consideration. How do we make it harder to cut our funding next time this comes around. Thank you to a lot of people. Thank you very, very much. That's it. Yeah. So for the first question, I'm so glad you asked your question was, am I representing GitHub and their views? I'm not. <laughs> I work at GitHub, which is really important context because it's really important for all of us, of course, to know the perspective someone's coming from and who's paying their bills and feeding their family. Um, but I am not speaking for GitHub at all. Um, I am speaking for myself, Kara. Um, your second question was about uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, the foundation funding slide. And say, can you say again what you said there? Oh, why did I include employment? Yes, okay. So the reason that I included employment is because I believe that, let's see if it'll load, hold on. Here we go, ignore the venture fund thing. Okay, um, I believe that um, employment from a company to a project is a key part of the foundation funding model, not for every foundation, but for the majority of projects under foundations because that's key to the Linux Foundation model as well as some other foundations that um, companies are employing people to work on projects owned by the foundation and that that is a tight loop in a, in a positive way. Like this is good, it's not necessarily bad or anything, but I think it's, a, to me, companies employing people to work on projects is part of the foundation model. I'm not, so the, none of the numbers relate to that. Okay, so the number that I put in is the amount of money, here we go. 
do, do, do. Here we go. Absolutely, yeah. So the three hundred and four million dollars is if we go to ProPublica's um uh how much money foundation site, that's not the name of a site. <laughs> Nonprofit tracker, is that right? <laughs> so, <laughs> if you go to that and then you try to find the top software foundations and then you put them in a spreadsheet and then you put in how much ProPublica said they took in that year, and then you add those up. That's what the $304 million number is. Dwayne, so well put. The nine, it's, that's correct. It's the 990 reported revenue. So it excludes a bunch of stuff outside the US. It, um, in this case, excludes Wikimedia. It's a loose number. Um, which is why I put my little graph here just showing like, yeah, I'm just looking at total revenue in 2022. It doesn't break down stuff in those returns very well. So I look forward to better versions of this. Um, I know Shane um, uh, Kirkru has been doing nice work on how do we automatically pull this kind of stuff. And I know he's got some great open source work going around that. So I look forward to a better version of this. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just curious. I mean, I'm I'm someone who's done a lot of this, and there was like sustain OSS for a little while. Yeah. Before, I guess like, is there a place to have these kind of dynamic numbers? Like, that we need to have maybe not like some of that, but like where is there a place to tell where we have to start doing this kind of data process stuff, or is like starting something like this just like a good idea? Um. So the question is, where is the right place to talk about stuff like this? Is it potentially sustain? Is it potentially uh, the maintainer community, et cetera. So my take on this is, I guess, twofold. First of all, I love Sustain. Um, they have weekly, or sorry, every other week meetings on Fridays. It's super fun. It's great. Um, second of all, um, the maintainer community that we have at GitHub is really good, and we like talking about funding there. But overall, I think where we're going to solve the funding problem will be outside a space that um, any company helps maintain. Um, and I think that uh, I don't know what the right place is to have these conversations. It's been the most common question I've been asked. I don't know the answer. And um, I'm excited to promote something as that comes up. I think in terms of companies funding open source, FOSS funders is fantastic. That's definitely the right resource for that. But overall, I think it's these piecemeal bits. We don't have a spot to have an overall conversation. So yeah, Aaron. Contrast between the numbers of you know, what's going into the project versus the market cap of the companies or whatever. And I was wondering, as a question in terms of whatever you can speak to in this, but I'm also imagining it's an invitation to next steps in how to do this. I'm curious, what is the, is, are, are there statistical patterns that would give you things to think about the type of business model that different companies have in terms of, at the end of the day, where does their actual revenue come from and what how much does that relate to the open source software or not? Like, obviously, there's always companies that basically do something not really related to any of this, and they just happen to use open source software. And there's something else that's like, this is just a software company that basically just like tacks on some proprietary thing on like a giant open source stack and just like makes it make work. So there's like this range of revenue sources and what the amount of revenue sources. And is there any statistical pattern between what the company's actual business model is and their support for the ecosystem? That's a great question. The question was, is there is there uh, data around the model of a company and then how much and where the company gives money to, to FOSS? Um, I don't know of good data on that, but um, that would be very interesting to see. And I would be excited and interested to be proven wrong, right? Like, Because like my guess would be, it's very individual based, right? Like my guess is that an individual person fought a lot at a company and then that company did more funding for a little while. But I would love to be proven wrong. Dwayne, do you got data? Not data, but if you build me a Ooh. 
sweet. It sounds like Alison Randall's got some really good research on um, the shape of a company and how it contributes to open source. I love that. I guess that makes sense. There would be a lot around open source contribution and company shape, and then you can, even if it's not directly money, you can still look at some of those patterns. Other thought, honestly, comments, anything? Yeah, Mike. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I go up and down, right? Like, I think we all do. Like, I'll wake up one morning and I'll be like, do I, we're, we're fucked. <laughs> like, and then I wake up the next morning and be like, yeah, the smartest people I know work on this. We're going to solve it, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> Other thoughts? All the things you hinted at are going to be brought up in the next session in the afternoon. Uh, specifically, the hey, individual contributors are a key sustaining thing, but how do we actually make that happen? And that's the topics that uh, we'll be speaking about and having a panel about. Which I invited Kara to be on the panel, but she's not going to say it. I got the toddler lifestyle. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, though. So for folks who are, unlike me, able to be here in the afternoon, there's a bunch of really good stuff coming. There's a bunch of panels looking at sustainability. Thank you to Aaron and folks who put together and Salt who put together this like full track on funding. How do we talk about it? Um, I love seeing this at events, and I really appreciate that it's here at Fosse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The question was about bug bounties and product bounties and where that's been positive or negative. So that is a really good question. I am the wrong person to answer it, um, but I would love to hear someone's answer. I know there's a lot of complex, well, I know I know there's a lot of complex answers, especially in the security ecosystem um, around where that's been good and that's been bad. Um, what I have been seeing lately that's been really painful, um, where bug bounties are often real um there's been a, a lot of problems in the like blockchain space in my opinion where you get incentives to do open source oh that's my my time is up timer where uh to do open source um contributions or authentication that is um blockchain related in a way that it gives coins and that's generated an enormous amount of spam and a lot of weight on uh maintainers so i would be interested in you know, the difference between that and then successful bug bounty programs. Like, how do you reward people in a way that doesn't add a burden to the ecosystem is a really good question that I can't answer. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day.